Hello, everyone out there. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you for joining us for the fourth episode of Innovations in Conservation. Uh, a little orientation of where we're at. Uh, welcome to Crowdcast, which is an awesome platform I love to use for these interviews. Um, and we have a chat box. Uh, and I'd like to invite everyone to jump in on the chat box and please share with us where you're tuning in from and an emoji of your favorite animal. Uh, there's a ton of emojis of animals. You can choose anything you want. Uh, so if you just jump in the chat box, we'd love to hear uh, where you're calling in from and what animals you just love. So give that a second for people to get in there. And I'll jump in too in a second. Um, also want to let you know about a button on the bottom that says, ask a question. This is the box I would like you to use throughout the interview uh, to share the questions that you have for Cindy towards the end of the interview. We will have a chunk of time, 10 to 15 minutes, for Cindy to take questions from audience members. Uh, and that's the best place to put your question is at the bottom. Uh, you can also comment on other people's questions and even upvote uh, questions that have been asked. Great, so we have some folks coming in from Washington, DC with a penguin. Fort Collins with an octopus, uh, Champagne with a, is that an ant? It looks like an ant. Um, ooh, Principe Island with an elephant. I'm gonna chime in here. I don't know what my favorite animal is, it's hard to say. Poughkeepsie, New York, I'm calling in from with, do they have a chimpanzee? That would really be my favorite. Well, this is gonna be close enough. All right, love it. Keep them coming in. You know, want to see where everyone is from, and so happy to have you here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and kick things off now that we're live and people are here. Um, I am very excited again to be continuing this series of interviews on innovations and in conservation. Uh, today, I have a very special guest with us, Cindy McInnes. Uh, Cindy, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, so I grew up in the Midwest and fell in love with whales when I was really little. I mean, I don't really remember not being obsessed with whales. Um, I, I came out east, so I'm in Massachusetts right now. Um, I came out east for college, and I really liked whales, but I was not turned on to sciences. And so I didn't end up studying bio or anything like that in college. I studied psych because I knew I wanted to work with people when I got older. Um, and I really focused in learning and development, so kids and, and teaching and that sort of thing. And then after graduation, I moved home. And after about two weeks, realized I didn't want to live there. And so I came out east, back out to Boston, and I went whale watching. And I talked to the crew on the boat, and I was like, oh my gosh, how do I get a job? In the back of my mind, I thought, oh, well, maybe when I retire from whatever job I have, you know, then I could volunteer on a whale watch boat. And so I talked to the crew and um, they said they had an internship program. And so I left my resume and like any unemployed college student, I drove across country for a couple weeks. And the day that I got back home, the whale watch company called and invited me to come out to be an intern. And so I said, yep, give me a week to pack up and I will be out there. So I came out and I was an intern on the boat. And then the next summer I worked in the galley serving food and I was not very good at that because I just wanted to watch the whales. Um, but then the next year I got the job as naturalist. So the person that talks on the boat and it was a dream job. I mean, I, to me, being able to go out and watch whales and teach people about them was, was amazing. Um, so I did that about two years in, I met a professor from the university of Georgia, John Shell, and we went out that night and, um, literally on a napkin kind of scratched out a plan for a class for him to bring students up to Massachusetts. And what he was teaching was, um, it was kind of social learning theory. So how natural learning takes place in natural settings. So the students were going to come up, they were going to learn about whales and then kind of reflect on their experience learning and how they could take that back to the classroom. So that class exposed me to these, I don't know, just different ideas. And I ended up going back for my master's and I did an interdisciplinary studies 
degree, created my own program. I took different educational theories and applied it to a four hour whale watch. So how could we maximize learning for people and the potential for behavior change? So I spent the next you know decade or so kind of growing that program, ran the internship program because it, the interns were critical to, to educating people aboard. Um, and I'm very grateful for all of those interns that worked with us. Um, but I also ran workshops, led workshops at conferences, did some local teacher workshops, and John and I co-taught that class for about 10 years. Um, and this whole time, in the back of my mind, I was trying to figure out how to take whales on the road. So I did a couple trips. There was um, WhaleNet is this teacher resource website that has a plastic models to make a plastic inflatable whale. And so I took that on the road a couple times. But I really wanted the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile <laughs> because I thought I could easily put a tail and flippers on it and um, you know take that on the road. Uh, and 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 I really when I started whale watching, we took so many school groups out to see whales. And so the kids were getting out on the water and experiencing whales. And and in the last 20 years, that's just decreased dramatically. And that's that could be a whole other, hmm. you know, talk about why that's happening. Um, but I wanted to bring whales into the classroom because I felt like even kids out here weren't being exposed to, you know, what was right in their backyard. Um, and so in 2012, it was like through a funny Facebook exchange, I thought, what if I got a really nice inflatable whale and eventually had a car that was wrapped. So there's the mobile part. And I've always kind of called this idea the whale mobile. Hmm. And so I found a company that had made one or two inflatable whales and we designed my whale. Um, and so I've had it for about 12 years or not 12 years, seven years. Um, and I travel all over. I've been to 13 States, went to a whale festival in England. That was pretty amazing. So I've had probably over 25,000, people in the whale in the last seven years. Wow. That's very exciting. And, and for those uh, who are online, I want to give you an opportunity to answer two polls that we have here. Uh, again, the polls should be at the bottom of your screen. The first one is, have you ever even been inside of an inflatable whale? Uh, so far, we have five votes on no. I'd love to see if there's anyone here who has been in an inflatable whale. Uh, you know, spoiler, I'll say I have been, but it wasn't a humpback. Um, and the second question is, does your conservation program engage or tar and or target school children? Um, and there's some options here of, it's your primary audience. It is, but it's not your primary audience. Uh, no, and not sure, don't know. Um, so our, our votes for people who have never been in an inflatable whale seems to only be increasing. <laughs> uh, so it seems like a good opportunity to uh, check the calendar and see where you where and when you can get in an inflatable whale. Um, and interesting, so in terms of programs targeting school children, uh, seems like the most right now uh, have school children as an audience, but maybe not the primary audience. Um, and for others on the line, be great to get your, your inputs here. We only have a, a, a percentage so far of those who are online. So uh, I originally met Cindy uh, last year at the Conservation Marketing and Engagement Congress, uh, which was a conference we held outside of DC in October of last year. Um, Cindy gave a, I believe it was a speed presentation, right, Cindy? Like a five yeah, minute, yeah. was it less, it was like yeah. 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. Um, and Cindy's presentation was on the whale mobile. You actually gave two presentations, but the, the one that I, that really stuck out for me um, included a story for um, about a set of school children that, you know, had the experience of going inside the inflatable whale uh, and made some pretty remarkable changes afterwards. Uh, and, and I really wanted to invite Cindy onto this uh, interview program to share this story with us. Um, and mainly because quite honestly, uh, I have traditionally been a bit cynical about school children being a primary target audience of conservation programs. Uh, certainly I understand the role as, as um, secondary, even tertiary 
I don't even know if that's the right word, tertiary, thirdiary uh, audiences. Um, you know, I have always definitely understood their role in kind of the next generation, right? And typically that's what we think of why we're doing outreach for, for school children. Then the next generation, we got to impact, you know, them already. Um, but I have been admittedly cynical about their role in conservation today and taking action. Uh, Cindy's story uh, proved me wrong and I'm excited for this conversation to continue to prove me wrong. Um, and it's very timely. I actually posted an article uh, in the chat box here from Scientific American that talks about children changing their parents and changing adults' minds, especially on climate change. Uh, focuses a lot on, on Greta Thurn Thurnberg, I hope I'm saying that correctly, who not only has been a, a, a voice of a younger generation, but first had to convince her parents of the issue before she could become that voice of this younger generation. Uh, so a fascinating story there. I, I urge you to check it out. Um, and really, I'd love to, uh, you know, as uh, as we do with this interview, turn over the mic to Cindy to share this story with all of us uh, and have uh, a discussion, a dialogue, and certainly please chime in on the chat box and the questions as I'm probably not the only cynic out there. So love to discuss uh, how these efforts work and how we can do more of them in our work. Uh, so Cindy, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'm gonna put up your slides now. Uh, okay. Okay, so when I, um, I just wanna give a tiny bit of background too about what the program looks like. But when I think about my path to conservation, it started with loving whales. And so that's always in the back of my mind when I'm talking to kids. Um, I think one of my, I don't know, underlying philosophies and approach to education is that we can serve what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we're taught by Baba Diem. Um, and so when I think about me, my love for whales turned into a love for the environment and really looking at my behaviors and how they impact the environment. And I just always go back to that it started with loving whales because I learned about them when I was little. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I do these programs, you know, my goal and I tell the kids, I, I want them to leave thinking whales are really cool. Um, so I, what I do is I start with an assembly and I have um, three basic things. I tell them my background, I tell them about whales in general, and then I tell them about humpbacks. Um, I tell them about my background because I grew up in the Midwest. You can flip that picture up. And I always, I start with this picture and I ask the kids what state this is. So real quick, put in the, in the chat box what state this is, if you know what it is. Because sometimes it takes me two or three minutes for the kids to actually get what state this is. Thank you, Audrey. Um, Nailed it I, on the first go. <laughs> so even, it's funny because even the teachers kind of look around and they're like, I don't know what state that is. Um, but I point out that I grew up in a really landlocked state and that whales live at least 900 miles away from me. Um, but that I love them from when I was a little kid. Um, and I talk about how in fifth grade, my art teacher told me I could not do whales on any more art projects. Um, that, you know, I would draw my cute little whale on the chalkboard. Yes, the chalkboard. And they, some, you know, my classmates would draw a big shark eating it or stick a harpoon in it. Or, you know, they just, I was mercil mercilessly kind of teased for it. But I just didn't let them get, let it get to me because I just thought they were really cool. Um, and so I want to share that with kids. And also the, the, you know, when I got my internship, I had no boat experience, I had no ocean experience, but I talked to them and I wanted to, you know, I, I talked to enough people that I could find it. So this was my fifth grade school picture where you see the whales on my, my clothing and I always show that to the students too. Um, and it's not just it, the sweater here, it's like no, the, it's turtleneck the turtleneck also has it and the sweater. Still continues today. <laughs> um, so then the next thing I do is I talk about the whales in general, and then I introduce humpbacks. So my model, my humpback whale, life-size inflatable humpback whale, is actually modeled after a whale named Niall, who is a whale that we see off the coast of Massachusetts. So she's one of my favorites. Um, the very first trip I did as a naturalist by myself, she was right next to the boat. Um, and there was actually a piece of trash next to her. And I remember talking about trash and how that impacts the whales. And that was 24 years ago, you know. Um, so she's just definitely one of my favorites. And so she spends most of the summer off the coast of Massachusetts. Um, 
And it's actually one of the coolest things that I had not even thought about was that the kids that come and see the whale mobile could then go whale watching and actually see this whale. And so I show video of her um, and that sort of thing. So then I always inflate the whale in front of the kids um, because it's absolutely my favorite thing. So here's just a quick time lapse. It actually inflates in about 45 seconds. Um, and so as the whale is inflating, um, the volume in the room just gets higher. So once it gets about two thirds of the way inflated, um, the volume in the room just increases as it goes up the rest of the way. So then after the whale inflates, um, so that's what it, that's what it looks like. Um, after it inflates, I take one group at a time inside the whale Oops. and Come on, let me see. There we go. see if it works. Yep. Um, and when we're in there, we kind of work outside in. So we skin and then blubber and muscle and skeleton. And I have the heart and the ribs and lungs and vertebrae all sewn on the inside. And then the digestive tract goes back. Um, and so I actually have, since this picture was taken, I've actually added two more stomachs and the intestines and the poop shoot, as I call it, um, just because I whales, you know, as we've learned in the last few years, probably one of their most important roles is to help fertilize the oceans. And so I always talk to the kids about that and about how plankton is really important for us because it helps provide us oxygen that we breathe. Um, and so that's what we talk about inside the whale. And then I give them um, baleen and teeth and bones and little fake sand eels to touch. So then we go outside the whale. And so to me, I feel like this is the kind of whales a really cool piece um, that I want, you know, the, the, the kind of like, wow, I think these are amazing. Um, and then we go out and we talk trash. And so I start out with a game to talk about how long it takes things to biodegrade or decompose. And I break that down depending on what age I'm talking to. Um, really getting at the point that plastic and styrofoam are the biggest problem because they stay around for the longest. And then looking at what can we do. <clears throat> and so I, I talk about when we talk, when I talk about what we can do, I talk about how things leave our house. So things leave in some people compost stuff, some people recycle stuff, and some most stuff goes in the trash. And unless you're making a donation, that's pretty much how stuff leaves our house. But I talk about how when we put our recycle bins at the end of the street, we kind of lose control over what's happening because if nobody wants to buy our recycling, then it can end up in a landfill. And so I say what we do have control over is what goes into our house. And so then I present reuse, replace, and refuse. And that's kind of what I focus on. And I just have different pieces of trash and talk to the kids about, you know, plastic bags and straws. And um, this year I introduced the single use plastic word, which was a new word in the dictionary as of 2018. Mm. Um, and talk about what, what, you know, what we would do with different things. Um, and so this school that I went to last year, so that's kind of the program in a nutshell. Um, with this school last year in Stoneham, the kids went back to their classroom and the teacher started a conversation about where they see styrofoam or plastic in their lives. And so they started talking about the cafeteria and how they have lunch tray styrofoam trays in the cafeteria. And so persuasive essays are something that the students have to write for part of the standards. Um, and so all the students in the third grade and there were there were probably about 60, 65 kids in the third grade. Um, and so they all wrote persuasive letters to the superintendent about this issue of styrofoam trays in their lunchroom and how styrofoam doesn't break down and they think that it's wasteful and it costs money to buy the, the styrofoam trays over and over where they could buy, you know, plastic reusable ones um, and not have to spend as much money over a long, long term. And so the superintendent got all these letters and then six of the students were chosen to go to the school committee meeting. And so they prepared a speech, it's about a minute and a half. Their, their piece of it was about a minute and a half about why they should get rid of the styrofoam trays in the lunchroom. And I think there's a link, or we can put, put up a link. I'm gonna post that right now. And this is a <laughs> link of actually the, their presentation to the school committee. Yeah, yeah, and so it's at about seven minutes is when they, they do their presentation. But the conversation lasts for about 20 minutes. Hmm. And and it's just, I've watched it multiple times and every time I get something new out of it, but 
Um, it starts a conversation about the use of all of the kind of single use plastic. Um, so they talk about the silverware and um, the cups and, and plastic and, you know, possibly looking at replacing that. But ultimately they decided that they would get rid of the styrofoam trays in not just that one school, but all three of the elementary schools in Stoneham. Oh. And so that was, I just blew me away. Um, but I think too, one of the coolest things was how encouraging the school committee was to these students. So these students, I mean, they, they made comments like, you know, adults don't come this prepared to these meetings. Thank you so much for being prepared. <laughs> and for the students, they got to see how they, how change happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, at, at such a young level, I just think it was, um, it was so, so neat. Um, and so, yeah, it's about 20 minute conversation. So the end of the school year was pretty much coming. And so it was the, the fall this year, they had all plastic reusable trays in the lunchroom. And it was kind of cool because I actually got to tell the students this year I went back and the teachers hadn't told the third the third graders that I saw that this had happened. And so I actually got to tell them that their class, you know, classmates basically were the ones that made that that change happen. Um, and actually even last spring, once I got the lady that had had booked me to come in and sent me an email about this happening. And so I went back into the classroom to talk to the students and just tell them, thank you for doing it. And, you know, praise them for, for the change that they had made, because I think that that's something that can be so powerful for those students. And Cindy, what grade did you say this was again? It was third grade. So, so they're like eight and nine years old. Eight and nine, nine years old. In third grade. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what, you know, and thank you so much for, for sharing the story uh, again. I'm sure you've told it maybe a few times already. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and the thing that struck me when I heard this was, you know, honestly, one, I it's been a long time since I've been in elementary school. Um, and I didn't realize things like styrofoam trays and disposable plastic and all of that are, are still being used that regularly. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, not even in the, my consideration set of things that are happening today. Uh, so that was a, a nice kind of wake up call of where do all of these environmental conservation issues exist? Mm -hmm. um, and it also struck me as well, be like I kind of planted that seed before of what's the role of engaging school children? Is it just they are the next generation or is there, there are real changes that they can start both within themselves uh, start to make today, but also affecting true change mm -hmm. in both their homes and at school. Uh, and that, you know, was, a, you know, for me, sort of a mind blown moment of it's not just about they're the next generation, like they're here today and they have a very strong voice. Um, now, I know you've done a lot of different school visits and visited with many different groups. Um, do you think there was one kind of special or critical ingredient in this particular school group or, or school visit that you had that motivated this group of kids to take action a afterwards as compared to some of the other groups you've visited with? Yeah, I've thought about that quite a bit. And I, I honestly think it's probably the teacher engagement. Mm. So it's, it's the teachers taking that experience and taking it to the next level. And so that's something that I've really been thinking about over the last year is how, how do I capitalize on that? You know, and how do I, how do I encourage teachers to then take it to the next level? And then that becomes almost a, an additional audience. Absolutely. It, right? Absolutely. But I think that that's, I mean, I think that that's, true with conservation is that there's always this interplay between adults and kids. I think both happens at the same time. Um, and in this particular case, you know, was there something special about that teacher, so to speak, that helped them be more engaged where they also, you know, had similar like whale background that you had or not that I know of, but so, I mean, some, some classes that I go visit, you know, they, they study whales, mm -hmm. um, and others don't, you know, sometimes it's just a one off for the whole elementary school and other times it's a more focused, you know, we've studied whales and those this comes in and wraps up the season. 
Um, and I think that was the case. So I think that that, that has more potential maybe for to further the experience. Uh, and with this kind of, you know, having had this experience and seeing the potential outcome and results that could be achieved through uh, an interaction and engagement like this, did it shape or change your lesson plan or approach, you know, for all your kind of following uh, school visits after that? Yeah, it definitely did. I first of all told every class that I've been to um, about these kids that made a difference because mm -hmm. I think that, um, well, let me back up. So first of all, I, when I tell them, I want you guys to think whales are cool. I also say, and I know something that I could do to help protect them. So I mm -hmm. not only tell the kids that I want them to think the whales are cool, but that they are going to learn something that they can do. And so it kind of starting the empowerment, I guess, in the beginning. Um, but when I do the trash talk, I think it's, it has definitely kind of reshaped, I think, the trash talk a little bit because I do tell the kids now um, about the story with mm -hmm. Stoneham. And I also, when I'm doing that, I try to make eye contact with the teachers mm. and kind of give them a little nod about, you know, you can, <laughs> you can do this too. Um, <laughs> and then, and so, and I talk about empowering them uh, that they have powerful voices and they can make a difference on an individual level um, with, you know, and so with their choices that they make, they can talk to their family and they can also make a difference on a community level. Um, and sometimes I even say, you know, you guys can't vote yet, but you can still make change, you know, that you can still have a powerful, um, powerful impact. And then the other thing that I really make a point of doing is sharing that, you know, I teach about this stuff every day. And sometimes I find myself at the grocery without my bags. And mm. so what do I do? You know, it's it's not like when you want to make these changes, it has to be perfect 100% of the time, you know, I forget my bags. And so then I look for a cardboard box, or I try to carry out stuff. And, um, you know, so kind of talking about how it's not it's all of us do, doing a little bit. It's not one person having to make all these changes all at once. It's the, all these little things that we can do so that they're not overwhelmed. I want them to be empowered to make a difference, but not thinking, oh, my God, I got to remember my bags and not ask for straws and not use water, you know, everything all at once. So right. really kind of trying to break it down into small things that they can do. To avoid, I mean, something I talk about a lot is the whole choice overload analysis paralysis thing happens yeah. at any age. You know, in our intention to help people, we tend to give a lot of options, but that yeah. doesn't always help the cause. Yeah. Um, I, I love that you share with the kids that other kids have made this change, you know, and that gets into, uh, you know, the, the social proof aspect, uh, even peer <coughs> pressure aspect of uh, and, and the empowerment. It's, well, mm. you know, if, if, you know, that group of third graders over there can do it, so can we. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting to think that, you know, let's say, again, something like styrofoam plates in the cafeteria, you know, the adults in that setting may see that it's a problem or, you know, may just be kind of too busy to see that it's a problem. Mm. And everyone else, like myself and parents, aren't actually seeing that. They're, they're not there in those situations. So to recognize that there are places where kids can see you know, uh, excessive use of plastics or, or styrofoam and then be empowered to do something about it mm. feels like a very interesting space for them to own uh, mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily getting owned by, by other people, mm -hmm. um, both in their homes and, and at school. Um, have you seen, uh, you know, additional school groups doing similar kind of initiatives? I had, there was a school in Rochester, New York, actually, that, um, and it was a K-1-2 school, and they had, um, in their lunchroom, they had the little plastic wrap that had a spoon, knife, fork, straw, and napkin, you know, mm -hmm. all inside mm -hmm. of it. And so every day at lunch, they had to take all of it, you know, regardless of whether they just needed a spoon. And so the kids said they didn't like that. So they got replaced with the individual dispensers of, you know, one spoon, one knife, or one fork, which oh. just reduces, you know, when you look at a lunchroom yeah. and you see everything that's thrown away, it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah. So, wow. so reducing that is, was incredible too. And that was all initiated by the kids. That's amazing. Uh, and I, I want to recognize uh, Carrie's 
comment here. She says, I use curriculum aligned teacher's guides that are left behind and supported by videos and letter writing between my characters and the students. Ooh, characters, that sound like there might be mascots involved. I have to, we'll have to find out more about this. Um, teachers want, uh, teachers watch the students, oh, puppets. Uh, teachers watch the students take control of the information. Uh, and, and is that part of uh, your lesson plan as well? Some kind of leave behind or, or it, even like a teacher's lesson plan? Yeah, it's it's in the works still. Um, but you know, I just, I want to have it just be, like all online that the teachers can access, a, you know, ahead pre and post visit. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I mentioned this article a few times uh, and I'm kind of stuck on it mainly because I read it fairly recently. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's top of mind. Uh, and again, this is the article I posted in from Scientific American um, and talks about, uh, there's actually a term that they introduce here, which uh, may not be a, a newly created term, but this idea of I wrote it down, where is it? Child to parent intergenerational learning, um, which is basically the opposite direction than what we normally think of. We normally think of adult or parent to child learning. Uh, and, you know, what's kind of cool today or your know, kids are much more woke than we are uh, and much more internet savvy than we are. So there is a lot that we can learn from the younger generations. Um, and your story has a lot of really great parallels to this article. Um, kind of, you know, branching out a bit and just thinking about conservation programs overall and conservationists, what are some things you think we could be doing to, to either reach more children generally as additional audiences um, and equip them with the tools and the support they need to do this child to parent, child to adult intergenerational learning? Um, well, I just, I, I mean, as a mom, you know, I think, I think about this past year, my daughter studied the Civil War, so this isn't conservation related, but um, I, I read four, five, six books about that time period because she was reading some of them. Mm. Um, and we did a whole vacation about the Civil War because wow. that's what she was, she's into history. And so I think as a parent, it, I'm certainly inclined anything that they've shown an interest in you know, I want to feed that mm -hmm. somehow, whether it's an experience or books or whatever. And so I think that as parents, we definitely have that desire um, to, to follow what our kids are interested in. Um, and so I think there's kind of an innate uh, drive there to do that. Um, I think as conservationists, I think one of the things that I was thinking of is just to think of every interaction as, as having learning potential. You know, when my kids' friends are over and they see me, you know, not getting out a metal straw or something like that, you know, that's a learning potential for that kid to go home and talk to their parents about it. Um, and so I think modeling certainly, you know, in our communities um, is, is important. I think there are so many stories of kids that are making a difference and that those can be highlighted. So if... Mm -hmm you know, within our conservation organizations, um, highlighting those stories and using them as models to inspire other kids to do things, I think is really important. Um, you know, and I, there's a couple books about kids that have made a difference. And, and I think the more social media there is and that sort of thing, I think these little, you know, little stories highlighting a difference um, can, can be important for adults to see as well as, as kids to see. Mm. Um, because if the kid's so inspired and then they see another kid that did something that might spark the, spark the wheels turning. Um, to me, the, the, I was thinking about the upper elementary audience. Mm. So for me, third, fourth, and fifth grade is my favorite age to do because they've studied photosynthesis and I could talk about poop and how that makes a big difference. And I feel like they can, they can get that. And all the kids love to talk about poop. Um, but it, they're also, you know, they're in this kind of window before they're, uh, they're, they're just excited about learning and they can get excited and behind things and really try to make, to make a difference. Um, and then the, the other thing that I was thinking about just is engaging teachers, mm -hmm. um, you know, and really empowering teachers to 
you know, as much as they can within what they have to teach, um, they have to teach persuasive writing. And so if there is a topic that a teacher is passionate about, you know, maybe take a little bit of time and teach the kids about it and then have them write about that topic, you know, so taking the, the things that they have to teach, but mm -hmm. make the content about, you know, maybe a conservation issue. And then if the kids do that, then they will likely go home and talk to their parents about it too. Right. And is, you know, so I love this idea of, of the empowerment of that age group, that they can make a difference. Does it require much more on our end beyond saying like, hey, look, like, you can make a difference and just actually sending that message. Uh, I don't know how often that's sent um, or does it require even more support? Um, I think so much of it just depends on the kids. Mm -hmm. I think just saying that is something that will motivate some kids. Um, something that I've been thinking about is, is trying to create like a, an after school program. And I don't really like, if it would be in different schools, but something where I guess like an environmental club where they would meet once a month and talk about a conservation issue and then make a plan for what they could do to help it. Um, you're getting, you know, one of the things that people always talk about in conservation is you're getting that the I can't think of the word, the audience that's already hooked in. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I, I don't think that that's there's always more that we can do. So even if the kids are interested about it, they may not be, you know, maybe they're conservation minded in their house, but they're not thinking about the school. And so, you know, just creating maybe that space mm -hmm. that kids that are interested in the topic can go learn and be encouraged and maybe guided to do more on a community level or, you know, local level, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that I've been toying with. How do I, how, how can I create something like that, hmm. you know, and have it in a couple different schools or in different communities? I'm not sure what it would look like, but that's a thing about that the last couple months. And, and I expect a big challenge as well is that kind of middle school to high school age. Uh, you know, we, a lot of us do kind of naturally grow up loving animals and nature. Uh, and this actually came up in my uh, interview with uh, Gautam Shah, who does um, video games on conservation issues. Like, you know, we, we all grew up with that. We just love animals. Um, but there does seem to be this like dark period <laughs> where other interests come in uh, and, you know, life starts to get in the way somewhere between high school, middle school, even college. Um, and, you know, thinking about how do we bridge that gap between that uh, upper middle school, you know, elementary school, kind of w when kids can be jazzed about this topic mm -hmm. and make sure it doesn't disappear when, you know, life starts to get in the way. Um, have you done any programs with older children? I have. And um, I, to me, sixth and seventh graders, I love it because they're cool. And then they go inside of the whale and they, they're just like kids again. Like, oh, my God, it's so cool. Um, I, think, I think something that's kind of interesting is I feel like there's more funding for enrichment type programs in younger school, you know, younger grades. And I, and I, I and this is just my feeling. I'm not, I don't have anything to back this up. But it seems like more of the enrichment type programs as kids are getting older is about being a good person and other issues that teens are dealing with, you know what I mean? Right. As opposed yeah. to fluffy, you know, yeah. like an offshoot of a science, you know, sort of enrichment mm. thing. Um, but I think providing opportunities, I mean, one of the things that I always did on the boat, um, anytime a kid would look at me, like I looked at that naturalist, like, oh my God, I want to be you when I grow up. I would invite them to come out and work on the boat. Oh, cool. um, so I actually did a, uh, I met this girl, and of course, if they're from Indiana, forget it. I'm like, yes, come out. <laughs> so there was a girl from Indiana that I met probably five years ago, and she came out whale watching, and then I actually went to her her elementary school in Indiana and did a program, and just this past winter, I did a program for somebody else in Indiana that she used to babysit for, um, and so, and she is going to a school in South Coastal Carolina, I think, you know, to do marine biology, and so I think when you get kids that are really 
it's hard for middle school or high school students to volunteer sometimes, mm -hmm. but I think providing them the opportunity to do that is really important because yeah. that exposure and, you know, talk about empowering that they get to go interact with, like on the whale watch boat, they get to interact with people and share their knowledge and yeah. passengers love it. They love it when kids come up and t tell them about the whales. That's cool. Uh, that's a great, yeah, I mean, that just a, deepens the connection and, engage, and engagement factor, you know, at, even as their abilities and options tend to, to expand. Yep. Um, and, and I love that you mentioned uh, the whale watch, so that segues well into my next question, uh, which is that you also deal a lot with adults, uh, you know, certainly on, on whale watch boats. And uh, as we all know in our work, you know, adults come with their own set of challenges of engaging them in, in conservation issues. Um, are, are there any tricks that you've taken from working with kids and just kind of applied them to adults and they work really well? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely things that when I explained things with the whale mobile, I would get on the whale watch boat and I'm like, oh, this is a much better explanation. You know, <laughs> even like when, you, when I talk to kids about how whales breathe and how it's just air that comes out of their blowhole and they don't share the same passageways. And then I'll say, you know, like if somebody tells a joke, when you drink a glass of milk, what happens? It comes out of your nose. <laughs> and so I thought, well, why don't I say that on the whale watch? Like, you know, the kids laugh at it and the adults laugh at it as well. And so kind of using funny things like that, um, I do, but I think just, I think a lot of what we do on the boat is, well, to me on the boat, the learning takes place in small interactions. Mm. It, I talk on the PA, but I don't, I think people get, take a little bit of it, but not as much that it takes us an hour to get out to the whales and an hour to get back. And that's where most of the, t the learning takes place and the kind of inspire inspiration, I guess. Um, and so even, you know, always having pictures or things that engage children, engage the adults. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I get a family, I try to engage the kids, hoping that the parents see their kids engaged and, you know, also engage as well. Um, I think really, I think education is such a key to conservation. Um, one of the things that we see almost every single day are balloons out on the water. And so if it's, if the weather is nice enough and it's, you know, easy, um, we try to pick the balloons up. Sometimes if it's a really choppy day, it just logistically gets a little tricky. I wish we could pick up every single balloon that we see. Um, but we do try to pick them up, but we always use that as a learning opportunity. You know, like you don't realize that when the balloons go up in the air and they lose their helium, they end up a lot of times in the ocean. And so encouraging people to, you know, don't put balloons on your mailbox, make a cool poster board sign and tap it on your mailbox or, um, you know, really taking advantage of those opportunities to to um to teach both the adults and the kids and then i think i mean we kind of referenced this earlier but empowering the adults adults and telling them that they can make a difference yeah. but for me i focus on one thing so yes because it's just so overwhelming when you start reading about all the stuff that's happening to the ocean it's like oh god we're doomed and so i feel like as m my responsibility as an educator is to help get rid of the paralysis and so on the boat it's either entanglement and fishing gear or it's marine debris those are my two issues that i will bring up and it depends on what happens on the trip mm -hmm. um for us over half of our humpbacks have been entangled in fishing gear so it's often really obvious to talk about that right. and so if i talk about that then i tell people to think about the seafood that they eat and that's that's my suggestion of what people can do and if it's if it's one of those days, it's really interesting. I've seen a lot more trash, I feel like, out there this year, just like plastic floating around. Um, and so if that's the case, then, you know, let's think about our single use plastic. So it's really focusing on one thing that people can do as opposed to overwhelming them with five different things that they can do after this experience on a whale watch boat. I don't want to do that. It's really, really focusing on one thing is what I what I try to do to keep it simple. And that is, you know, certainly music to my ears for anyone who reads the stuff I write. It's always focused on that. Um, and, and actually, so your example of like, if there's a balloon out in the water or d the debris and let's take it out, let's look at it. Um, it just it suddenly reminded me of a piece of the book called Switch 
Uh, I don't know if you've read it or other people. So mm. Switch is by uh, Dan and Chip Heath. Uh, it's a really, you know, it's a breeze of a book to get through. It's just very captivating uh, to read. And it's all about changing behaviors. Uh, and there's an example in there that I can't, you know, totally remember, but it's in my brain somewhere of, uh, you know, really putting those things in front of people. Uh, so it's not we're just talking in the abstract. It's like this is how much garbage we've seen today and showing it. And that is just such a wake up call for people. Um, yeah. And that's especially challenging and uh, an opportunity sometimes to fill that gap in conservation when we're talking about something that's out there, something we don't get to see is finding a way to really bring the issues and the opportunities face to face with people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what is, what's next for Nile and the Whale Mobile? What do you have coming up? Um, so I have a big summer of travel. Well, I'm, I'm headed to Indiana for a couple of weeks on the big library yep. program. So I have about 17 programs lined up at the library in Indiana, um, which I just love. It's, it's so different to take it to the Midwest where it's so different from their everyday life. It's mm. really exciting. Um, I mean, one of the, my big goals is to really work on my pre and post activities to maximize what the kids are going to get out of the experience. Um, and I, there's a lot of great curriculum out there, but I have seen so many cool things in the schools that I've been to and the projects that teachers have done. So I think this spring I was taking pictures of a lot of things. And so I'm working on writing those up to give other people ideas about things to do. This one school had, um, you know, scale models of all the different whales hanging from the ceiling and then kelp-like things with facts, you know, hanging down. And it just looked so neat. It was such an awesome display of what the kids had learned. Um, and then traveling, I've been to 13 states. I'd love to hit all 50, but wow. we'll, see. we'll see how long that takes. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately having, having another whale and having one travel around the country and one, you know, that's maybe focused more locally because I don't have necessarily the ability to spend the entire the year traveling. Mm -hmm. um, but I really, I just think kids, kids and adults just love it. And so it's a great way to inspire them. Um, so those are, those are the, the big ones. Uh, so it sounds like an opportunity for anyone on here to send an invite to get you some, to some new states and we'll have to yep, yep. what, what states you need are top on, of your list. Um, and how do you carry around Nile, the inflatable so, whale? It actually gets surprisingly small. It was funny because my dad was like, it's going to be like a tent. You can never get it back into the bag after you <laughs> unpack it. Right. But I'm good. It's funny because I roll it up sometimes and I'm like, ooh, that was a really good roll. Um, so it's just in the back of my minivan. And it ends up being like, what is it, like 30 pounds? Four, oh, no, it's like 105 what? pounds. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's a workout yeah, right there. It is a workout. <laughs> so after after like a week of, of whale mobiles, I'm always like, cool. It's physically <laughs> exhausting. It's good though. It's good. Keeps me young. Um, and so we do have some questions. Uh, we have two questions here from the audience uh, and we still have some time to take these. So you, you up for some questions, Cindy? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I will ask these out loud and for anyone else who's on, uh, feel free to jump in and ask addi additional questions that you have. Um, I'm gonna take the first one, which is from Audrey. Audrey says, do you have a sense of how or if these kids' parents are aware of and affected by the changes these kids made? Um, are those changes being reflected at home? And is it enough to just have these changes and behaviors happening at school? and not also at home. So there's a few questions in here. Um, uh, let's start with the first first one. Or did you get a sense of whether those kids' parents, either the six that presented or the whole class, uh, were their parents involved, engaged, even aware? Um, well, I know the, the parents of the kids that were at the school committee were at the, the meeting. Mm. Um, but I honestly, I don't know if they were made aware of, mm. of that. Of some schools that I go to, they're, um, the kids all go home with a half sheet about, you know, the PTO sponsored this and this is kind of what your kids learned. Um, but it certainly would be something for me to leave with all the students, you know, a take home postcard or something like that that gives them ideas about things that they could do at their house. Because, no, I mean, ultimately it's, it's you want it to happen 
on an individual level, a family level, and a community level. And so I think, right. yeah, that would be a next a next phase to figure out ways to make sure that the parents are made aware of a any changes that the kids you know did. Um, but also, yeah, what they can, what they, how, what they learned at school could impact their lives. Great. Uh, and I think the, the second part of that question, I think you touched on, uh, but are those changes being reflected at home? Is it enough to just happen at school? Sounds like you were saying next level is to bring it home and yeah. see how we can uh, help facilitate that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, definitely. Um, next question is from Christina. Can you make an orca for the West Coast? There, there is one out there somewhere. Um, uh, somewhere up in the Pacific Northwest, they do have an orca. That occasionally, I've seen, maybe it was in Southern Washington or Oregon, I saw a post, you know, somebody did a talk and the, that whale was going to be there. It's one of the Southern resident orcas, I think. It's a model of one of them. And, I mean, those can be those species that species itself is a bit smaller so i imagine yeah that i don't think you challenge. can go inside of that orca i think it's just a one you know the inflatable right so the, the larger it. whales are because yours is a totally life-size yeah so mine's 43 model. feet long and i mean i think i fit 30 fourth and fifth graders in there but it was packed it you know i couldn't if I have that many kids, I don't pass around the baleen or anything because I'm afraid somebody is going to get hit in the eye or something like that. So um, when I take the kids in, they're very much sitting in two rows and not moving. And mm -hmm. there are very strict rules. Uh, but it, it sounds like there's a, a growing number of inflatable whales across the country. There, there are. The company that I contacted is out of Minnesota, and they had made one. Um, they had made a fin whale that you could go inside of in Rhode Island. And they had made a humpback mother and calf that hung in the Children's Museum in Indianapolis. And so, and so now they've made, I was out there last summer. He said they've made about 20 of them since they made mine. Wow. So there are quite a few of them. At some point, I'd love to get all of them together. Right. Because there's five or six, seven different species at this point of all life-size inflatable whales. Um, and interesting that they're a Midwest state doing a landlocked state, yeah. basically, of yeah. the lakes doing that. Yeah. Um, and the one inflatable whale I had been inside of was uh, the North Atlantic right whale uh, that Whale and Dolphin Conservation recently created. So gotcha. there's a lot of different species out there. So yeah. um, uh, it's interesting, too, because the company is getting better and better oh. or, or they're changing it. So like right. the material is different and kind of how they're how you get in and out is different and it's they've right. made quite a little niche for themselves. Yeah. I mean the uh, the last interview was about mascots and you tend to see a, a similar trend with yeah. mascot makers. Um, so Christina added to that if there are contacts or I don't know if there's like a list of inflatable whales somewhere. If not, uh, maybe I'll put that on my to do list. I don't yeah. know yeah. <laughs> something of finding them. Um, and, and Carrie added to that any Canadian stops plan. Yes, let's summer. let's talk, Carrie. Okay, cool. Um, we have another question here. This question is from Ethan. What do you find to be the most effective way of getting young people to not only act locally, but see themselves as part of a global activist movement? Interesting question. Yeah. Um, I, I guess my initial response is that we the kids need to see themselves as purveyors of change does that make sense is that the right word um sure you know so if if they can i think i feel i feel like that's something that will grow with time um i mean always on the whale watch boat i always kind of you know i, I don't think somebody is going to come on a four-hour whale watch and be have a totally life-changing experience. I think it can happen, but I don't think that's the norm. I think we're exposing them to the whales, exposing them to the ideas, and hopefully they're going to come into contact with other things in their life that, you know, maybe it's another whale watch experience. And I found repeat customers were the ones that have had more behavior change. And mm -hmm. so I know it does make an impact when they're coming back. Um, but I think for kids, I think it's... Uh, I guess it's maybe talking about it, 
about how they could have um, an impact and ex but I'm not sh but I think it's probably more for me I'm more focused on getting them to see as see themselves as somebody that can make a difference yeah. and if it's in their circle then hopefully that circle will grow yeah you know as they get older and they see you know that they can have a bigger impact yeah, and I, I, you touched on this, like there has to be other points around them too, reinforcing this. And it, it does raise the question and even the need of, um, you know, engagement with schools so that, you know, even maybe it's individual teachers incorporating it or schools offering activities around this. Um, or as you suggested, even outside of school, extracurricular activities. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations um, and even like park associations that are, creating opportunities to engage children in different ways where they can see themselves as part of a movement. Um, and I would add, you know, the more that we share these, uh, these success stories, these even very small, what we would might call small wins, uh, you know, we're going to get the, the Greta's of the world and start to help kids see that they do have this voice, they do have this power, uh, and, and they can affect change, you know, even on a grander scale than maybe they even thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is like convert language right there, man. <laughs> I, I, you totally sold me on this. Uh, I'm just going to change my entire business model now. Um, but e Ethan, thank you for that question. That's a great, great question. Yeah. Um, so we have just a few minutes. If anyone has a uh, lingering or unanswered question, uh, please chime in now. Um, but it sounds like, or it looks like, that we have covered everything, which is exciting. Um, so I, I just want to, you know, Cindy, I want to thank you so much for yeah. taking the time to be here. Uh, for everyone that has tuned in, thank you for being here live. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share that it's no small task for uh, my interview guests to show up. It's not just show up and talk. We, we do... Uh, a good bit of preparation and chatting and alignment on what we want to talk about. So um, I really appreciate the legwork that goes into this. Thank you, Cindy, so much for, for doing all of that. Um, I would encourage everyone to look at uh, the Society for Conservation Biology, especially the working group uh, that I'm a part of, which is the Conservation Marketing and Engagement Working Group. Uh, on the screen is a link where you can check out more information. Uh, and love for people to become a member of this. We are, uh, you'd have to be a member of, of SCB, the largest society, or we even have listservs that you can join for free. You don't have to be an official member. Uh, but we are planning to do our next conference in 2020, probably the September, October time period. Um, and these are opportunities where you get to hear about presentations, like what Cindy gave. She gave actually two present, at least two presentations, yeah. right, Cindy? Um, and it's an awesome time to bring together folks who are using different engagement tactics, uh, campaign messaging and marketing tactics to expand the reach of conservation and, and uh, motivate audiences who may not traditionally be as engaged as we'd like them to be in the topic. Um, so it definitely, it, it's a great resource and network that is growing uh, to talk about these kinds of um, both challenges and opportunities that we can leverage for our field. Um, and so again, thank you for everyone being here. This replay is going to be at this same link within a few minutes of me pressing the stop button. Uh, so if you want to share this link with other people, it's the exact same one that you joined and you can come back to this link to get the replay at any time. Uh, it's also going to go up on YouTube in about two weeks. Um, and my last call to action, I've already done choice overload. See, I need to you know, learn from my own uh, my own preaching. Um, there is a button at the bottom of the screen. If you have future interviewee suggestions, I'm all ears. I'd love to hear who you think we should uh, be speaking with and what kinds of topics we should be talking about. Um, Cindy, thank you again so much for being here. Really, yeah, thank really you. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for everybody that joined in. Yeah, and we look forward to hearing updates on uh, how your summer of travel goes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, and have Thanks. a great day and rest, rest of your week. Bye. Bye.